time. So um, I'm really thrilled that Betsy Hosa has been willing to join us today for another VCBH lecture. Um, Betsy is an endowed professor, the um, Bishop Joyce of Human Development in our own psychological Department of Psychological Science here. Um, Betsy is without question a nationally and internationally recognized expert in ADHD, how to treat it. Um, she uh, got onto that topic, I suspect. I didn't verify it with her, but looking at her CV um, at the uh, Western uh, Psychiatric Institute at the University of Pittsburgh, um, a, a renowned uh, research center for psychiatric conditions. And uh, she went there as an intern, did her postdoc, went on to be kept as an assistant professor. She, she must have done a great job and then was off to a brilliant career in this important area of research. Um, of relevance to VCBH, of course, is that uh, ADHD is a risk factor for adult substance use disorders and, of course, is a problem in and of itself, but, but cuts close to what many of us in the VCBH reckon, uh, research. Um, Betsy sits on the editorial boards of the um, highest impact journals in, in this area, has won national awards, is a university scholar, um, so uh, really an accomplished investigator. Um, she has been funded by uh, NIH, I think mostly NIMH, throughout her career on pharmacological and behavioral treatments for ADHD, and most recently has begun looking at um, aerobic exercise as an effective intervention for ADHD. And I was just mentioning to her, I mean, uh, we share interest in randomized control trials, but if I was to go on my own experience, uh, aerobic exercise, with, it's almost scary to think where I would be in terms of trying to manage professional stress without aerobic exercise. So someday I'm gonna join her in researching that, but today I look forward to hearing what she has to say in her area of expertise. So please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming today and spending a little time with me. I'm going to begin by acknowledging my funding sources and um, making the appropriate disclaimer that the views expressed in this talk are my own and not necessarily those of the funding sources. To give you an overview of where we're going today, we're kind of going to walk through some of the stages of my career. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about ADHD and evidence-based treatments because I began my career um, as a researcher of standard evidence-based treatments. And then I'll talk a little bit about how I came to the conclusion that there may be a need for lifestyle management approaches to ADHD and um, give you a little bit of information on the first randomized clinical trial that was done on the use of physical activity to manage ADHD, and then some preliminary data that we have just analyzed that's hot off the press that might be of interest to you. So that's kind of the overview. Most folks in this room probably already know this, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, ADHD is one of the most common disorders of childhood. Uh, the prevalence rates will vary depending on one source you look at, but according to the DSM-5, it afflicts roughly 5% of the childhood population, and it's roughly twice as common in boys than girls. Interestingly, the disorder is characterized by developmentally inappropriate levels of both inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity. And the reason I say developmentally inappropriate is that it's important to keep in mind that these same behaviors occur to some extent in typically developing populations, particularly at younger ages. So it only becomes a disorder when the levels of um, these symptoms exceed what would be expected to be normative. By definition, the disorder has to have an onset prior to age 12. It used to be age seven, now it's 12 has to be of at least six months duration and cause impairment in two or more settings. Now, there are multiple presentations. Uh, ADHD can present predominantly with inattention symptoms, predominantly with the hyperactive impulsive symptoms, or with both together. 
This is a very important slide. It's taken from the multimodal treatment study of children with ADHD, which is one of the largest studies still conducted to date, even though it was um, done about 20 years ago. The MTA sample is one of the best characterized ADHD samples that we have available to us. And the main take home point from this slide is that ADHD most often does not occur as a sole disorder. So only in about 30% uh, of cases do you find ADHD kids having no other disorder. And there's many common comorbidities, things like oppositional disorder, anxiety, conduct problems, depression, and so on. So we need to keep that in mind when we think about how to approach treatment of ADHD. Even so, it's not necessarily the symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity that you focus on in treatment, but rather the problems in daily life functioning that are caused by these symptoms. And there's multiple domains that are afflicted, most commonly family, academic, uh, social, and then uh, participation in extracurricular or, or group or sport activities. I'll tell you a little bit about each of these. In the family domain, it's very common for there to be parent-child conflict, generally centered around management of the child's behavior. Similarly, there's a high level of conflict between parenting partners who have um, co-parenting responsibility for a child with ADHD. There's often disagreement about how to manage the child. Uh, probands often have conflicts with siblings, and the overall family environment is often very stressed. In terms of academic difficulties, children with ADHD have a variety of challenges. They often have difficulty completing work, get, just getting assignments done. Even if they complete work, they may have rushed through it and not have done an accurate job, which obviously has academic implications for them. And then just staying on task well enough to complete tasks is very, very challenging. One area where ADHD kids definitely struggle, although it's certainly not in the diagnostic criteria, is with organization. Although executive functioning is not, um, you know, everybody with ADHD doesn't have executive functioning difficulties. It's not a defining feature of ADHD, but many individuals do. And we see this manifested in organizational difficulties. Kids often forget to bring home the materials they need to do their work, or they forgot to write down what the assignment is. Um, probably the most frustrating for parents is when the um, kids did their assignment, got it done, and then forgot to turn it in. So they still didn't get credit for it. And um, just generally maintaining organization in terms of managing day-to-day -day assignments as well as your room at home, your desk at school, and so on. In the social or peer domain, uh, work out of our lab with the multimodal treatment study of children with ADHD data has documented that somewhere between 50 and 80 percent roughly of kids with ADHD are, are rejected by their peers. And the reason there's such a wide span here is because it depends on which measure you're using. But in general, uh, there are a variety of, of um, social challenges that individuals with ADHD face. They may be due either to the types of behavioral excesses that happen, things like um, being disruptive to ongoing activities, being in someone's face, which would be rather annoying and intrusive, or it could be from the opposite type of problem, just not having the skills, uh, the social skills needed to be able to uh, join a game appropriately. Or uh, a big factor for them is often reading social cues that are going on in the social environment. So we don't, can't say for certain whether the skill or performance deficit is the most critical. I think most people are saying that if you ask a child with ADHD what to do in a social situation, they can usually tell you, but they can't do it in the moment. So that would lean towards saying that a performance deficit might be um, the best way to characterize it. So with this big constellation of challenges, how do we treat ADHD? Well, I've spent the majority of my career on this question beginning uh, roughly 30 years ago. Um, when I was a postdoc, I was trained by um, somebody that was in the forefront of the field. And I remember our first conversations where he said to me, Betsy, there's three evidence-based treatments for ADHD, behavior modification, medication, and their combination. And 30 years later, I can tell you that even though there have been other treatments that have been tried and tested to various degrees, if you want to talk about which treatments are solidly evidence-based, 
it's still behavior modification, usually through parent training or contingency management, medication, generally with stimulants, the types of stimulant preparations and some alternatives to stimulants have emerged, um, but still medication is a core way to treat the disorder and the combination of the two. So that in itself is a little bit disheartening to me. I feel like maybe we should have moved more forward, but I'm gonna to talk to you about studies that I've done that's compared these treatments and how I came to the conclusion personally that we need to do something else. So the multimodal treatment study of children with ADHD compared these evidence-based treatments. So specifically, it uh, provided 14 months of very intensive treatment. This was a randomized clinical trial uh, to almost 600 kids that were randomly assigned to medication alone, behavior therapy alone, uh, the combination of the two, or the bottom group is community care. This study is important because these were really intensive treatments, probably more intensive than you can actually get in the real world. And we treated the uh, families for 14 months, at which point we stopped treatment and then continued to follow them on an ongoing basis um, for up to 16 years. And we just finished following these individuals. But I'm gonna focus on the first three years because that helps me make the point that I'm trying to make. Averaged across the treatment period, what we saw, and on this graph, lower is better because you wanna have fewer symptoms and this is a measure of symptoms. When we compared these treatments at the end of the 14 months of treatment, what we found was that combined and medication treatment were significantly superior to behavioral therapy and the community care. So that's this time point right here. However, if you follow out to the 24 month after baseline period, you can see that that uh, difference is diminishing and by the three year point is totally gone. There's no significant differences among the groups. So what we know is that these very intensive treatments temporarily reduced the symptoms, but once we stopped them, the symptoms came back, basically. Looking at this yet another way, one question we wanted to ask in the multimodal treatment study was at the end of those 14 months of treatment, had we quote unquote normalized any of the children so that they were indistinguishable from their peers? So we had to define a point at which we thought the level of symptomatology was comparable to what you'd see in typically developing kids. Because remember I said, these levels of symptoms are present to some extent in everybody. So we defined just a little as the point at which um, we'd consider an individual to be normalized. And then we looked at the proportion in each of the four groups that were normalized at the end of treatment. And we found it to be the case for 25% of the uh, control or community care group, a third of the behavior therapy group, a little over half of the med medication group, and two thirds of the combined group. So even at the most intensive end of treatment point, there was a large percentage of individuals who were still showing significant levels of symptoms and had not reached that level of bringing the symptoms down to a, a level comparable to peers, okay? So after thinking about these data for a long time, and I won't say I'm only one, the only one that came to this conclusion because I'm certainly not, but it certainly seemed that ADHD is chronic. It's a, it's a lifelong disorder in the majority of cases. So it really seems like we're thinking about it the wrong way. Providing eight weeks of treatment or 12 weeks of treatment or 14 months of treatment isn't really gonna alter the trajectory of the disorder as we saw from the other slide. So it seems that we really need to be shifting to a chronic management style similar to those that we use for medical disorders that are chronic like you know, diabetes or asthma. Now I'd like to tell you that this was my bright idea to uh, use physical activity to manage ADHD, but that would be a flat out lie. So I'll tell you the true story. The true story was back in 2007, I loaded up my graduate students into a University of Vermont van, and here we are driving to Philadelphia to a national conference where we're gonna present our research. And we had seven hours in the car, and I don't like wasting time, so I said to my grads, we're gonna spend this day in the car planning our series of studies for the next five years. Isn't that exciting? And um, all of the individuals in the van with one exception were my students. The person who was the exception turned out to be incredibly important. And that was this young woman who was married to my graduate student. 
she was a teacher in the community and just wanted to tag along. She wanted to attend the conference with us. And I said, sure, you know, the more the merrier. So off we go and we're talking about evidence-based treatments and the randomized clinical trials that we've done in the you know, university setting and how wonderful our research is. And she gets really frustrated with us. And she says, you guys just don't get it. I'm out in the schools. I'm in the trenches. I work with these kids every day, day in and day out. It's lovely what you're doing, but you can't take a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old with ADHD and expect them to sit behind a desk for six hours and maintain attention. It just doesn't work. What somebody really should do is come and run these kids around in the gym before school for a good long time and see if that helps them sit still. And the van got really silent because this was a really different viewpoint than what we were used to hearing. And I sat there and I thought about it for a while and I said, you know, that's an interesting idea, but it's so simple. If it were that simple, you would think somebody would have done that by now. So when we came back from the conference, I did a lit review. I was trying to find whether anybody had used physical activity to try to manage ADHD. I found a couple of dissertations. Nothing was published. So I decided to look into the literature. Uh, I went upstairs and talked to some of my colleagues in um, neuroscience and biobehavioral psychology, and I learned about how research shows that physical activity can impact the structure and functioning of the brain. I did a lot of reading. I came upon this document from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And this was a um, document they put out that summarized the effects of physical activity on typically developing kids in the school setting. So this had nothing to do with ADHD. But I did find this lovely quote in this document, which I provided on the slide, and which made my mind up that this was the way to go. It says, research has shown that physical movement can affect the brain's physiology by increasing cerebral capillary growth, blood flow, oxygenation, reduction of neurotropins, growth of nerve cells in the hippocampus, neurotransmitter levels, development of nerve connections, density of neural networks, brain tissue volume, and I was blown away. ADHD is a brain disorder. Look at all this good stuff that exercise does for the brain. I was convinced at that point, we really need to try this. And of course, it didn't hurt that um, this document also made the case that all these physiological changes are going to promote better attention. So I was totally sold at this point. So I put together a team. Initially, John Green and I, together, uh, I got to give credit to John. He was the um, person upstairs in the neuroscience faculty that you know I had many conversations with about this idea and was it worth pursuing, was it not pursuing? So he and I put a grant in together to the NIH that actually combined both human studies and animal studies. Um, we tried to do parallel studies um, across species. We ran into some issues like the fact that um, his subjects were already adolescents by three weeks of age. So it was hard to get the studies done by the time um, to, to make it parallel to the ages I was looking at. So it, there were some real challenges there. But um, this was our first team. And um, the human sites, is, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, were here at the University of Vermont. And we also ran subjects at Purdue University. And then the animal sites were UVM and Dartmouth. So in terms of the human study, our major question was what effect does aerobic physical activity have on five to eight-year-old children in terms of the core symptoms of ADHD, hyperactivity, impulsivity, as well as associated um, difficulties like cognitive, motor, behavioral, and social functioning. So we recruited roughly 200 kids across the two sites. Half of them were high risk for ADHD and the other half were typically developing. Why did we go high risk rather than clinically diagnosed? For one very simple reason, we wanted to do a school-based study out in the community and there was probably, there's probably no school in the United States that would allow us in the doors if we said we're gonna come in and screen for ADHD and tell you you have X number of kids with ADHD because that would then obligate them to provide services for all those children. So we went from a high risk perspective um, in identifying our kids we tried to get kids who were medication naive, or actually all of our kids were not on medication during this study. From an IRB perspective um, and an ethics perspective, we felt like we would take them into the study if they were, we hoped for medication naive, but a few of them had been previously on medication, so they had to enter off medication 
But we also tracked whether or not they went on medication through the duration of our study, because that was an important, interesting outcome. And I didn't include it um, in my slides today, but only um, four of them out of 100 ended up being medicated throughout the duration of the study because we were able to manage the symptoms without the medication. So the kids were very young, kindergarten, first and second grade. The study was done in Vermont and Indiana, so the sample was predominantly white. We had a little bit of diversity. It was a randomized control trial. We randomized kids to either five day a week before school aerobic physical activity or a five day a week um, structured classroom intervention, also you know, run in parallel fashion before school. The groups were equated on demographics. The physical activity curriculum that we used was develop, developed specifically for this study. Uh, it was designed to be applicable to everyone in the school setting, both those with and without behavior problems. So it's kind of a general program of sustained behavioral, sustained moderate to vigorous physical activity. And um, the thing about working with kids this young is you're not going to get their cooperation if you say, oh, we're going to go work out now. You, ha you have to trick them into working out like they have to think they're going to play and they're going to have a lot of fun. So it was all in the form of enjoyable games that they would really be excited about playing. This is what the structure of the program looked like. It began with a two minute instant activity, also ended with a two minute instant activity. I'll explain in a minute why we called it an instant activity. And then there were three stations in between each eight minutes in duration and a one minute transition between the statements, between the stations. And all of these activities were meant to keep the kids moving the entire time. The entire program is manualized and very detailed so that it would be replicable if somebody wanted to try the program. Now, for the instant activities, we did not allow any instructions. So they were all follow me games. So the adult leader would say, do what I do, and off they would go. And the reason for that is we did not want to waste time talking. We wanted them to get as much moderate to vigorous physical activity in the 32 minutes as possible. So we would teach through modeling in that segment. And similarly, during the station activities, adults were allowed to spend no more than 20 seconds explaining um, the game that was coming up. Importantly, staff members are considered critical participants. So this is not a program where adults are permitted to sit around and tell kids to play. The adults play with, which is a really great way to role model what it is we're trying to achieve. The control condition was a structured classroom. We set it up to be very parallel in design. And so it ran before school. It had a beginning and end large group activity of two minutes duration and three stations. Uh, we happened to use art as the activity to keep the kids occupied in the structured classroom. This was not an art therapy intervention, so please don't interpret it that way. And we did not allow any behavior management system in either program because we didn't want the confound of some other treatment going on. But we had a little issue with that, which I'll describe later, and we'll have to come back to that point. So this is our demographics. We were pretty successful in getting close to 50-50 on ADHD risk and typically developing kids. Uh, a few more boys than girls, but it was pretty even. And then a pretty good grade distribution. Our goal was to get at least 75% participation. The reason that we chose that is we thought that it's really hard to get treatment compliance when you're doing like parent training. And so we wanted to choose a number a priori that would mean the minimal dose that we thought represented the full treatment. We chose 75 and um, we, we achieved that across all the groups. Blue is our ADHD risk kids that got physical activity. Green are the ADHD risk kids in the structured classroom. And the two gray bars are the typically developing kids in the two treatments. These were not significantly different though. We did a manipulation check to make sure we actually did increase aerobic capacity through our physical activity intervention. We used the PACER test, which is a standard test of aerobic capacity, and um, we did find that we significantly increased aerobic capacity in the physical activity program, but not in the structured classroom. Okay, so our results from this randomized clinical trial, uh, we analyzed two different ways. First, our most conservative way was a mixed model ANOVA, where we use time, pre and post, status, ADHD risk are typically developing, and then intervention type, physical activity versus structured classroom. And we um, looked at a variety of outcomes, inattention, hyperactivity, social functioning, and mood. 
we got two um, significant effects by this most conservative way of analyzing the data, and that was we found that physical activity was significantly more effective than the structured classroom by parent report for inattention, for improving inattention, and also for improving moodiness. Because this was the first randomized clinical trial ever looking at um, physical activity to manage ADHD, we did some post hoc follow up tests within intervention and status. These are less conservative tests, but I think it's important to at least get a deeper dive into the data, and I'm going to show you some of these. Just a reminder that all of these slides I'm going to show you are in terms of effect sizes, and um, a small effect, medium, and large effect are uh, roughly 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.8. So in terms of parent report, what you see here is that for hyperactive impulsive symptoms, um, we saw a reduction in symptoms across all the groups, but the largest magnitude effects were for the two groups that got the physical activity intervention. That was for hyperactive impulsive symptoms. It was also true for inattention. So um, a very clearly larger magnitude um, for the two physical activity groups. We did not expect any particular thing on the oppositional symptoms, so we didn't really make too much of what we got there. We just thought it was interesting to assess that as well. Now here's where we got a really perplexing finding, and um, that is, that according to teacher report of hyperactive symptoms, the ADHD risk group that got physical activity um, and the ADHD risk group in the structured classroom both uh, improved pretty much. But we thought about what had happened that may have created this pattern of results. Well, it didn't take us very long to figure it out because in a typical classroom, there would be one or two children with ADHD in the classroom because the prevalence rate is 5%, so maybe one out of every 20 students. In our classrooms, we had 50% ADHD kids in the classroom with typically developing kids. There was a lot of chaos. With a 50% composition being kids with ADHD, the teachers in those structured classrooms really struggled hard to maintain order. In fact, I had one that walked out and on the way out said, I'm leaving, I'm never coming back, and she didn't. So it was really, really challenging to manage those classrooms. We had to do something to keep the environment safe. We also had to maintain credibility with the schools. We couldn't sit there and let the you know, chaos be breaking. So, we really wanted to not implement a full behavioral intervention because that would be a confound. So I said to my teachers in the structured classroom, I said, this is how I want you to manage behavior. When things get out of control, you just say to the whole classroom, everyone, hands in your lap, eyes on me. And tell them we're not going to proceed until everyone in the room has their hands in their lap and their eyes on me. And they did that every single day multiple times for many weeks, over and over and over again. So my guess is that what we see here is we trained these kids who were in the structured classroom to look like students who were sitting in their seats with their hands in their lap and their eyes on me. That looks like a kid that's sitting still and paying attention. So that's my explanation of this finding. Um, I would love to replicate this and see if that could be replicated, but that is what I really think happened, having been in those classrooms day in and day out. <clears throat> when we looked at peer functioning, what we found was that um, the largest magnitude change for peer behavior was in the ADHD risk group that got physical activity. Um, we also saw a significant effect for the TD kids in physical activity and those in the classroom sort of significant effect too, but it wasn't of the same magnitude. Um, for peer reputation, only the ADHD kids in physical activity showed a significant improvement. And that's pretty uh, important because it's really hard to change peer reputation. That's a really, really difficult behavior um, characteristic to change. By teacher report, only the kids that got physical activity showed improvement in peer behavior, and that was regardless of whether they were ADHD risk or typically developing. So they definitely saw improvements in peer behavior as a function of the physical activity program. In terms of mood, both parents of typically developing kids and children who were ADHD risk saw significant improvements in mood as a function of physical activity. Teachers didn't notice that effect. So summing it up, um, this 
First RCT, we believe, showed some preliminary support for the use of physical activity as an intervention to reduce impairment associated with ADHD. We did get some evidence in home and school domains, but we were surprised by how much the typically developing kids also benefited. When you think about it, though, it's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, exercise is good for everybody, so why should we be surprised that everybody benefited? Um, and we really did wish we'd had a no-treatment control group, but um, obviously, when you're funded by NIH, you have to decide your critical groups. You can't do all of them. So then we decided, we were trying to think about what we wanted to do next. Uh, we considered a variety of different options. And what made our mind up was coming back to the idea that physical activity can really have a dramatic impact on brain development. We reasoned that if that's the case, wouldn't it make sense to do the intervention at a time period in development when the brain is developing even more rapidly, when it's even more malleable. So we decided to go younger. Um, and we took the program and applied it to preschool because we wanted to try to capitalize on um, some of those early effects in, in the hopes that maybe we could even offset the development of some symptoms, which that's going to be a long time to provide evidence of prevention using this method. I mean, we're nowhere near being able to make that claim, but that's kind of our lofty long-term goal to show that physical activity can maybe delay or prevent the onset of ADHD symptoms. Whether we'll be successful or not, ask me in 10 years. So initially, we took the CATS program that was designed for kindergarten through third graders and applied it to preschoolers. Didn't work. Um, we talked to the teachers that worked with us during that initial trial where the um, original CATS program was applied to the preschoolers. We did focus groups with them. We gathered as much information about why it wasn't working as we had hoped. And we redesigned the whole program into a completely new curriculum, which we call Kitty Cats. And um, I have to give a lot of credit to Lori Meyer. He, she's our colleague here in early childhood education. She actually wrote the Kitty Cats manual and made sure that it was really right on for that three to five year old age, age range. Um, the rest of our team, there's myself, Connie Tompkins from Exercise and Movement Science, and then my colleague, Erin Schulberg. Of course, my grads who are sitting here in the audience, Marissa and Ollie. They're all part of the team, and Hannah is up there, I see. She's one of our RAs. So I'm going to show you a video. I think the best way to explain what Kitty Cats looks like at this age range is to show you um, exactly what it looks like. Kitty Cats on the Move is a physical activity curriculum designed for use in schools and community settings. Currently, Kitty Cats programs are implemented in local Vermont preschools through a partnership between the University of Vermont, Champlain Valley Head Start, and their partner sites. Kitty Cats aims to engage children in sustained moderate to vigorous physical activity during each program session and teaches children the importance of being physically active. To learn more about the program, we asked some of our Kitty Cats friends for help. What is Kitty Cats time? They have fun, play, and do everything else. Yeah, what kind of things do you do during Kitty Cats time? Um, um, playing games, running around, doing exercises. <laughs> Jumping. What else might you do in kitty cat's time? <laughs> Each kitty cat's program session is 32 minutes and follows a plan, do, review sequence popularized by the High Scope Early Childhood Curriculum. The program starts with a plan period where the Kitty Cats team reads a social story, reviews program rules, and reviews the activities for that day. Playing games can be fun. You can run, jump, and hop with your friends. If we want to be healthy and strong, we need to keep our muscles moving. Who can raise their hand and tell me one of the Kitty Cats rules? Emma? Okay, safe We're gonna start with popcorn, popcorn, spaceships, Barnyard escape, and then, do you know what game this is? Rich! What 
I was in Mr. Fox. And then we'll do some stretching, okay? Each program session has four five minute do periods where children and teachers play fun activities that aim to get heart rates up and encourage everyone to move at a moderate to vigorous level. In between due periods are one minute review periods where Kitty Cat's teachers provide positive, specific praise to children and review the directions for the next activity. One, two, three, eyes on me. That was a great game of popcorn, popcorn. I heard Emma singing the song the whole time, but Sabrina kept her body moving every second. The fourth and final review period is two minutes long. During this period, the Kitty Cats teachers give specific praise to children, talk about the importance of physical activity, and lead the group in a stretch to end the session. All righty, everyone, down on the ground for our favorite. What's for lunch today? Pizza! Time for our pizza stretch. Put your legs out like a big slice of pizza. Can anyone tell me what our muscles do? Make the pickle strong. Make the They do make you pick up strong things. Because your muscles hold on to your bones and your muscles help your bones move. So when we have the time to make our muscles strong, it's helping it make it easier for our body to move our bones. Kitty Cat's time is a lot of fun. We asked our friends to tell us what their favorite parts of Kitty Cat's time are. Stretch, stretching, stretching. Yeah. 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 So I like to stretch. Stretching. stretching. What's your favorite stretch to do? The pizza. The pizza. Pizza. Yeah. The box. Pizza. 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 Exercise. What kind of moves did you do? Uh, jumping jack. Jumping jack. Awesome. Did you have a favorite game? Yeah. What was it? Uh, uh, kitty cat time. <laughs> yeah, kitty cats are strong. Yeah, kitty cats are strong. Yeah, we are being healthy and strong. Can you show me your muscles? Whoa, look at those strong muscles. Did you have fun today? Yeah. Awesome. Was it fun? Yes! One, two, three. Okay, so um, basically that shows you what the kids' perspective of the physical activity is. They think they're playing games. There's a big educational component teaching them about physical activity and its effect on the body. Uh, I, feel, I can tell that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move a little quicker here. But we're alternating five-minute uh, aerobic physical activity periods with one-minute review periods, and then we end at the end with a stretching and final uh, educational period about the importance of physical activity. We rely a lot on visuals because at this age it's helpful, and a large portion of our sample is also an English language learner population, so this is really beneficial from that perspective. We do have a pretty detailed manual that has three levels. Level one is the simplest level of activities, and level three is the most complex level. And we ask leaders to tailor the games that they use to the level of the classroom that they're working in. And there are ways to simplify and challenge kids even within those levels. So let's look at some of the preliminary data. And this is very new data. We've only been doing the Kitty Cats program for the past three years. Each year we've been running it in somewhere between seven and nine classrooms each and every year. So somewhere between 80 and 100 kids each year. Um, 
And our population is very diverse, as you saw. The measures we've most been focusing on are accelerometry, because that's an objective measure of how much physical activity the kids are doing in the light, moderate, and vigorous range, as well as teacher ratings of behavioral and peer adjustment and teacher judgments of uh, school readiness. So um, we began five accelerometer assessments across the school year in the 2017 to 18 year, and we've been doing that subsequently in each year. Three occur during the Kitty Cats program, two during baselines. We have a fall baseline and a winter baseline. What we're trying to understand is whether the Kitty Cats program um, causes the children to participate in more physical activity than when the program is not being administered. What we've found is that yes, uh, and we've, we've replicated this across all of the cohorts, that I, adding when the Kitty Cats program is in place, kids participate in significantly more moderate to vigorous physical activity and less sedentary time than when the program is not running. Putting this a little differently, looking at data across the five time points, you can see here, and, and an important point is that this is in moderate to vigorous physical activity minutes per hour. So the changes look small, but this is for one single hour. And when you multiply that by like six or eight hours that the kids are in, in daycare, it's a bigger effect. But we just did it this way because it's easier to quantify. What you see is that from baseline to intervention, we see physical activity goes up. When we withdraw it during winter baseline, it goes back down. When we reinstate it, it starts to go back up. And then in the spring, it goes up even higher. I have my little friend here in the snowsuit to remind you, or remind me to tell you that there are definitely challenges with this program in the winter time because most of our classrooms have to do it outside. So once you put on boots and snow suits and heavy coats and hats and gloves, it's really hard to get those kids moving vigorously. And that does affect our data. You can see a little bit the levels we're able to achieve, but we're still getting um, significantly more MVPA during winter intervention than during winter baseline. And then the fall intervention was significantly greater than both fall and winter baseline. And the spring intervention was significantly greater than both baselines as well as winter intervention. We also looked at school readiness. Does physical activity improve school readiness? You would hope that it would because if it does have these beneficial effects on the brain and helps brain development, you would think that would um, perhaps translate into better school readiness. We use the TS Gold as our measure of school readiness and ask whether um, it rates, relates to improvement over the course of a school year. So this is compliance with the Institute of Medicine physical activity guidelines, which requires 15 minutes of physical activity per each waking hour of a young child's day. And what we found um, is that yes, indeed compliance with greater compliance with the IOM guidelines significantly predicted school readiness in all five of these domains, social, emotional, physical, language, cognitive, and literacy. And then finally, we did notice that there seemed to be some groups that or some subgroups of children that seem to benefit more than others from the intervention. So we wanted to take a preliminary look at moderators. We have very little testing time because our testing all occurs during the school day and we have to be careful how much time we pull the kids out. So we put our money first on a processing speed task because processing speed is something that's often uh, associated, uh, you know, deficits in processing speed are often associated with ADHD. And we asked whether baseline processing speed would moderate the association between change in MVPA and those in ADHD behaviors. And we looked across a variety of different outcomes, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, peer behavior, and peer reputation. We got significant moderation across all these outcomes and the pattern looked identical for all of them. So I'm just gonna show you one of them. And what we saw here is that it was primarily the kids that were at cognitive risk, those with low processing speed at baseline, that showed a significant improvement in hyperactivity impulsivity um, as a function of higher moderate to vigorous physical activity. For those that began the year with high processing speed that were not at cognitive risk, we didn't see that. So in a way that's good news because it means that those who are at most risk are deriving the most benefit from the intervention. And I can see that it's, I'm out of time. So I'm gonna stop there, but that was my last slide anyway. So <laughs> works out perfectly. Oh, actually I did have a couple more, but I think I'm out of time. So. 
Okay. So um, basically we think the preschool results are promising. We're going to keep going down this path. We have some new ideas for next year. I want to be really clear though. We're not recommending this as a replacement for standard evidence-based treatments for ADHD. It's, it's absolutely not appropriate at this stage to do that. What we're saying is that Physical activity may be a useful adjunct, something to add in addition to standard evidence-based treatments for ADHD. Um, and the reasons for that is it benefits everyone, both kids who have uh, ADHD or ADHD tendencies and those that don't. There were no side effects, so there's no reason not to do it. And it's something that can be used over the long term. And our hope by teaching kids the importance of physical activity and what it does for your body. And you can see that the kids, even at the three-year-old age range, are catching on to those ideas, even if it's in their own very simple language. We're hoping that as they learn to appreciate the importance of physical activity, it can grow into a self-management strategy. And we definitely have found that certain subgroups um, derive greater benefit. So I want to thank all my collaborators, um, faculty, grad, undergrad, RAs, everyone that's contributed to this work. And I think I'll stop there. Yeah, Mark. Um, in the preschool study, the kids are exercising at various times of the day. It was not standardized in the preschool study. In the randomized clinical trial, it was all before school. So that's an interesting question. One of the things we'd still like to look at is um, comparing exercise at different times of day. Uh, we haven't done that. Nobody that we're aware of has done that, but I think it, it would be an interesting question. It was measured by accelerometry. Um, do you know what an accelerometer is? It's like a little thing you wear on a belt, and then you take the data, and it, um, you can break it down into sedentary, light, moderate, and vigorous physical activity. And then we, we've used different metrics. We've used like percentage of time in a certain level of physical activity or percentage of days in compliance with the guidelines of 15 minutes per hour. No, they wore them for, well, right now in our study, we have them wearing them for uh, two-week periods, five times during the year, so 10 weeks out of the year. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Were we worried that the, I'm sorry, I can't. The teachers, comp, the teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a general um, shortcoming of using teacher ratings as an outcome for any study that uses teacher ratings as an outcome. You never really know unless you have people who are blind to condition coming in and doing ratings of behavior. Um, so, I mean, that, that could be an issue, but it pretty much plagues most studies in the field of ADHD because that's the most common outcome measure used. Yes? Thank you. Um, in that randomized controlled trial you uh, described first, not your own, but the big one, right? Because you were right. It looked like most of the treatment effect was due to the pharmacotherapy. Is that or when I saw the. Yeah, it just looked that yeah. way. Um, versus the behavior alone. Yeah, when you average across groups, that's what it looks like. I also had a few other slides that I tucked in here that um, kind of speak to this. What really is the case is when you, when you average across groups, that is in fact the case. But to really understand ADHD treatment, you need to break it down by comorbidity. And this slide shows it broken down by comorbidity. So if you're an ADHD kid with anxiety, the optimal treatment for you is a behavioral treatment. If you're an ADHD um, 
kid with both anxiety and oppositional disorder and ADHD, the best treatment for you is a combined treatment. So it's, that was an overly simplified slide and you really need to break it down by comorbidity to know which treatment is best. I remember the early study by, I think it was Judy Rappaport, showing that if you give the ADHD medication to normal kids and hyperactive kids, they all show a, a similar response. So mm -hmm. to some extent that the interventions that decrease hyperactivity do so in kids with and without the diagnosis. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And that's why ADHD medications are widely abused on college campuses. Yeah. So because everybody responds to the medication, whether they have ADHD or not. Yes. Well, that's an interesting question. We're doing it right now. Um, as part of a course that I'm teaching, we're placing students, UVM students, who learn about the importance of physical activity out in the community, and that's actually how we're getting this data. This is a study being conducted in the community. Um, we have had others, after our RCT was published, it got a lot of uh, national press, and so we had a local school actually come to us at that point and say, we want you to teach us how to do this so we can do it ourselves. So we did that. We went to the school and we taught them how to do it, and they did it themselves for a couple of years, and then the um, personnel changed over. It was a new principal, new teachers. And so I think it is definitely possible to get it going in the community, but it really seems to be dependent on how much the people in the schools believe that this is an important thing to do. Like the, the one school that did it on their own, they put it in the school budget. That was how much they believed that it was important. So um, I think with the right supports in place, it can be successful, but there are so many competing demands in, for school money these days. And with the emphasis on high test scores, often folks will think, well, we're gonna get more for our money by adding tutoring than we are by adding exercise, which I would take issue with that. That may not be the case. <laughs>